Thank you everyone for coming to the ISL Colloquium today. We're very happy to have Yushin Sen here virtually visiting us from Princeton. And he'll be telling us about some recent uh, theoretical work and advances in reinforcement learning from this group. So please take it away. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Kabir, for inviting me. And it's always great to visit Packer, even, <laughs> even though this time I have to do it virtually. All right, okay, so my talk today is about uh, the effectiveness and sometimes ineffectiveness of reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, this is joint work with several of my colleagues and also some of my students. Uh, so I'm trying to make I'm trying to make my motivation part very, very brief uh, because I think everybody understands why everybody has seen the recent excitement and recent advances of reinforcement learning. So probably no need for me to further motivate why we need to care about this. But let me just uh, emphasize some of the challenges uh, that we need to pay particular attention to. Okay, so. All right, okay. So in contrast to a lot of the control theory work, uh, reinforcement learning emphasizes a lot about uh, unknown environment. So we don't assume that we have a precise description of the model or the environments that we have. So you have to sort of learn the environment by interacting with it. Uh, in contrast also to, for example, the supervised learning, uh, the instantaneous rewards that you get in each of the sample transition uh, might not be the kind of things that we want to optimize. Uh, instead, you, need, you really need to think about things in a long-term manner, uh, and in particular, how your current action will affect what's happening in the future. And this is typically not something present in the classical supervised learning setup. And similar to many other modern machine learning problems, uh, we are coping with an unprecedentedly large problem dimension and which presents, as you can imagine, a lot of challenges, both statistically and computationally. And all of these challenges are further compounded by the presence of non convexity which is really everywhere uh, in most of the RL formulations. All right. Okay, so uh, in, uh, the two central issues of my talk is first, sample efficiency. Uh, we want to think about how to design algorithms, RL algorithms that are use as few samples as possible uh, without compromising their learning accuracy. And the reason is very simple. In mean, many of the applications collecting data samples could be either too expensive or too time consuming. So we do not really want to uh, spend a uh, uh, you spend too much cost on this or take too much time. If, if it takes too much time, it's going to be a problem for many of the uh, IO applications. We also want the algorithms to be able to perform reliably uh, within very short, reasonable time. We don't, because we have to deal with enormous day action space, we have to deal with non convexity We really want to make sure that the algorithm that we design is scalable to large dimensions. Okay, so these are two very you know, central issues that really permeates most of the uh, modern studies of reinforcement learning. Okay, so uh, many of you might know that reinforcement learning is not really a new thing. Actually, it has been investigated for a lot of decades already. Now, why there is still room for us to make improvement? So I would like to argue that a large body of the prior uh, RL analysis focus uh, largely on asymptotic analysis. In the sense that you have an algorithm and you study the behavior of the algorithm when, for example, the number of iterations go to infinity or the number of samples go to infinity, but we, the, the dimension of the problem held fixed. And this is a very typical thing that's happening in the previous uh, IO analysis. However, when we move towards the large dimensional applications, it's really very important to understand uh, how, because the dimension of the problem become enormous, you really need to cause for a new kind of uh, analysis that can, in some sense, captures uh, what's going on in a more non-asymptotic manner so as to take into account all of these problem parameters simultaneously rather than just assuming they are some fixed parameters. 
And this is something that's reminiscent of, you know, what the paradigm shift in statistics in the last, you know, let's say two decades. Uh, really in the statistical literature, a lot of the work switched from the classical large sample asymptotics to the more modern high dimensional statistics. And same thing is happening in reinforcement learning in order to get the better picture about what's going on uh, in the large dimensional applications. And as you can imagine, uh, because of the similarity to uh, modern high dimensional statistics, a lot of the tools that we have developed in the modern statistics and optimization community can be applied to help us understand better uh, the efficiency of reinforcement learning. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to try to give you two stories, uh, try to illustrate uh, why the modern uh, statistical optimization tools could be helpful for us, us to under improve our understanding of our IR. All right, okay. All right, okay, so uh, uh, in the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about two of our recent works uh, along this line. Uh, one, the, uh, and which covers two distinctive uh, approaches in reinforcement learning. One of them is called model-based IL, and the second one is a completely different uh, algorithm called policy-based IL. So in the first part, I'm going to focus more on the sample efficiency issue, and the second part, we're trying to talk about computation. All right. All right, okay, so, uh, but before I move on to uh, the concrete stories, uh, let me spend a little bit of time talking of introducing some of the basic uh, models and notation for RL. One of the bad thing about RL is that there are a huge number of notations needed in order to formulate the problem, but I'm trying to do some compression to only introduce to you some of the basic things required for this talk. All right, okay, so in this talk, I focus on the single agent RL. So that is one agent trying to inter interact with the environment. The environment has certain different kinds of uh, states. Uh, I use the, note, uh, the letter S to represent the state space. We assume this is a finite state space, so there's a fi finite number of possibilities there. Every single time step, the agent, based on his or her perceived state of the environment, tries to take an action. And the, part, the set of possible actions uh, this agent can take uh, is called an action space, denoted by this letter A. All right, okay. So, and, and in every time step, once the action is taken, uh, the environment is going to generate the so-called immediate reward which is a function of both the current state and the current action. Okay, in this talk, I'm going to assume that this reward function uh, is normalized, lies within zero and one, but this can be uh, significantly generalized. Okay, so there's one thing called policy. That's uh, something that you need to pay attention to, uh, which is basically the action selection rule. So it tells the agents if the S is the current state of the environment, what kind of action you are going to take. And this action selection rule can be either deterministic or uh, randomized, okay. All right, there's a one last ingredient that I'd like to introduce, which is the probability transition kernel of this environment denoted by P. So given the state S and the current action A and this function, tells us how the mark of decision process is going to transition into the next state. And in many situations, this kernel is assumed to be unknown. Okay, okay. so this is uh, some of the key ingredients about mark of decision process that you probably have already seen in some of the textbook or, or paper. Uh, one of the common objective uh, in uh, RL is to try to maximize this kind of some sort of long-term reward. Okay, so uh, here uh, V represents the so-called so value function and V pi basically means the value function if under the policy pi. So this function essentially for each state S, it captures the expected discounted reward of the mark of decision process if the initial state is given by this S, okay. 
So there's one per important parameter here that I asked, I'd like to uh, you to pay attention to is the so-called gamma. Okay, this is a discount factor. And I believe that John Sisekis is mentioned in his, some of his uh, keynote talk that uh, in, in, in general, actually, we might not really care about the discounted case. And this is more like a mathematical uh, 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 simplification of this part of the infinite horizon problem. But if you are able to take gamma to be something very close to one, actually, this somehow allows you to approximate a long horizon problem. It gives you some mathematical convenience, but sometimes also uh, it gives you a lot of insights about what's going to happen in finite horizon case as well. In fact, a lot of the messages that we develop here automatically translate to the finite horizon case as well. So one key parameter that you need to pay attention to is the so-called effective horizon, uh, which is given by one over one minus gamma. So it sort of like tells you uh, the typical horizon of this MDP in the, this discounted setting. And in this talk, we are assuming this effective horizon to be something that's, that's very large in order to model the long horizon problem. So what is the goal? Uh, the goal is to try to identify a policy uh, that maximizes the long-term reward. Okay, so we are going to use pi star to represent this optimal policy. Okay, and so it's, it's always guaranteed that there exists at least one policy that allows you to maximize the value function. And the resulting of, uh, value function uh, is called, is denoted by V star. So whenever I have a star, it means this represents some sort of optimality. Okay, so this is a problem, okay. Okay, so this is a basic setup. And now uh, let me try to move on to the, the first story, uh, basically about the sample complexity of uh, in under some very simple generative model. Okay, this is joint work with Gun Li, uh, my, uh, my postdoc, and also several collaborators, Yu Ting Wei, Yue Jie Chen, Yuan Tao. All right, okay. So if you know a lot about control, or dynamic programming. And this is something that you probably know. If I tell you the description, precise description of the MDP, and there is some very simple dynamic programming kind of uh, uh, algorithm that allows us to find the optimal policy in a very efficient manner, okay? So this is all uh, described, for example, in Bus Dimitri Basika's book. And if you're interested now, you can take a look at that book and that will tell you multiple algorithms that allows you to solve this problem efficiently if the model is known. The issue, however, is that uh, in RL, many times we do not assume the environment to be known. Uh, so you only get some samples from the environment. Now you need to learn, you, you hope that you can still learn the optimal policy based on some samples that you collected that represents the behavior of the, the environment. Okay, so they are more, so when, when, I, when we're talking about uh, sampling, uh, you need to describe what kind of sampling mechanism that you like to use in, uh, that you like to talk about for this case. Uh, there are multiple of them. Uh, in today's talk, I'm only going to talk about the simplest possible one. Uh, it's called the generative model or the simulator setting which uh, it uh, dates back to 20 years ago by Michael Kearns and uh, his co-authors. So the idea is uh, that the, this mechanism is very, very extremely simple. So every time there is a black box, okay, every time you can go to this black box called generative model, say, okay, I want to understand the state action pair SA. And then this black box is going to generate uh, uh, one sample transition for you based on the ground truth probability transition kernel. Okay, uh, you don't know the, uh, the, the transition kernel, but it, it allows you to generate something according to this transition kernel. Then what you can do is that maybe let's go over all the possible state action pair. Each of them, let's take a few samples, let's say N samples. You get to some independent samples and you try to see uh, how, what are we going to do if we only have these samples. 
So here, if under this model, the total number of samples you collect is capital N times the total number of state action pairs, which is S times A. Okay, so we want to do find the optimal policy based on the samples. Okay, so now if I'm, I formulate my question more precisely, is that uh, how many samples are really needed uh, in order to learn an epsilon optimal policy. So what do I mean by epsilon optimal policy? Uh, in this talk, I mean it's an epsilon optimal policy in an entry-wide sense. So we want to guarantee that for every single state, uh, the policy that I generate is epsilon close to optimal. Uh, basically, this needs to hold simultaneously for every single possible state. So this is like an L infinity norm based kind of epsilon optimality. And as you can imagine, this is a very simple model. So this has been analyzed by a lot of people, uh, including multiple people, uh, multiple uh, colleagues of my Princeton, in particular Monday Wang. Um, there are several uh, results that are very important in the literature. Uh, but let me try to actually, instead of asking you to look at this table, let me try to plot everything in, uh, in, in a picture so as to help you better understand what's, what has been known in this, this problem. Okay, so in this picture, uh, I'm plotting uh, uh, several things. The y-axis represents the sample complexity of certain algorithms analyzed in these works. And uh, the x-axis is something about 1 over epsilon squared. Okay, so the best result before our work is due to Agawa et al. Uh, Agawa, Sham Kakadi, uh, Lin Yang, and, uh, and, and I think maybe one other guy. So they were able to show the following. So basically, if you look at the, uh, this yellow line, this basically represents the achievability bound attained by this Agawa et al., which is like a state of the art. A nat if you are an information theorist, then, then your natural question to ask is, what is the information theoretic limit here? Uh, it turns out that there is a lower bound. There is a lower bound that has been known in the literature in the min-max sense, which I draw here in, the, in this blue line. So as you can see here, the minimax lower bound, which is like a converse bound, matches the achievability bound uh, derived by Agawa et al. As long as epsilon uh, is smaller than one over square root of one minus gamma. However, uh, when epsilon is larger than one over square root of one minus gamma, things are not really known. Actually, there is an achievability bound, there is a lower bound, but they do not match. Okay, so there is a gap here. And in fact, if I summarize all the achievability bounds in the literature is that all of the theory will work only after the sample size exceeds this number, S times A over one minus gamma squared. Uh, it's not known uh, what, whether we can go below this sample size while still performing in some reasonable manner. Okay, so you this, hey, question. Can, can you give some sense of what it means by these different thresholds? Like for example, one over square root of one minus gamma. What is oh. the meaning of this? Okay, so let me try to say something. So uh, as I mentioned, one over one minus gamma is like the effective horizon. So think about it as just like a horizon of the problem. Okay. And epsilon, the largest possible epsilon is one, min one over one minus gamma in this case. So it's sort of like saying that if, uh, if you look at the second number, one over square root of one minus gamma, this is like uh, the largest possible value divided by square root of the effective horizon. So if the horizon is large, this means that this epsilon actually, at least in the relative sense, this actually is very, very small. Does it make so somehow, sense? Somehow I should be dividing epsilon by the horizon or something like that? Yes, yes. So epsilon now is defined in an absolute sense. But I think a better way, I mean, this is a convention in the literature.
that if I'm the person to redefine things, I'm going to normalize it so that I treat epsilon divided by the largest possible epsilon, which is one over one minus gamma. So you can treat the leftmost number in this x axis as one in the relative sense. And the second one is going to be like one over square root of the horizon. So if the horizon is large, this relative epsilon actually is kind of small. Thank you. Okay, so, all right. And what is the meaning of labeling the axis one over epsilon squared, whereas the ticks are- Oh, that's, uh, that's uh, just a way for me to make these things like a, a straight line rather than the quadratic function. So okay. it does make it easier for me to draw. Yeah, but that, yeah. Okay. All right, okay. So this is the state of the art. Uh, and as I said, there is a gap between achievability bound and the converse when epsilon is, uh, and when epsilon increases. So now the question is that, uh, can, we develop, can we develop a better algorithm that allows us to close the gap and to help us understand what is really the sample efficiency limit, sample complexity limit for this problem? Okay, so uh, there are multiple different approaches, RL algorithms that have been widely used in practice. Uh, this one approach that's called the model-based approach, which essentially is like a plug-in approach. So basically the idea is very, very simple. Uh, I have got some samples. Let me try to just estimate this, uh, my model first by using whatever empirical estimate you have. And then you pretend that this is the true MDP. And then if you, 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 you assume this is a true MDP, then you can use whatever dynamic, uh, dynamic programming algorithm that you have in the control theory to solve it. And then you return your solution. Okay, so this is a, like a model-based approach. Basically, it's like a plug-in approach. There are also another, there's also another approach called model-free approach, but basically it just, proceeds to learn uh, the optimal policy without estimating the model. But okay, but in this talk, I'm going to focus on the first approach, the model-based approach. Okay, so let me try to be slightly more concrete. Okay, so just to remind you, I have collected some samples for each of the state action pair. Okay, and based on these, I can build my empirical estimate. Okay, so I have um, basically I have an empirical distribution of this probability transition kernel. Okay, based on using whatever, however many samples you you get. The issue, however, is that okay. So now, since we are trying to first estimate the model, now you might want to ask whether you have enough samples to estimate the model or not. Uh, it turns out that we do not really have enough samples, okay? So unless your sample size is larger than S squared times A, you do not have enough samples to estimate P in, in a reliable manner because the, total, the dimension of this P is square, S squared times A, okay? So, but the real question is that, what can you do if your sample size is way below the dimension of dimensionality of this probability transition curve. But the good thing is that eventually our goal, ultimate goal is not to get a reliable estimate of this transition kernel, but instead we only want to think about whether we can get the near optimal policy. And that probably do not really require you to first get a precise estimate about the transition curve. Okay. Okay, so now this is uh, this is the model based uh, estimator uh, that we have. Okay, so in most of the prior work, uh, people just do what I have described: estimate the transition kernel, plug this into whatever dynamic programming algorithm you have, and then you get the policy. Uh, in our work, we add one intermediate step uh, in the following. So we after estimating the empirical model, we perturb the reward function a little bit in a random manner, which I'm going to also describe a little bit more in detail. And then uh, you have the empirical transition kernel, you have the perturbed reward function, 
And then let's just try to run your dynamic program algorithm uh, for this, this new MDP, empirical perturbed MDP. And then you get your output uh, an optimal policy, okay? And this is uh, this basically is, is, is my algorithm. Now the question is, uh, is this algorithm performing in any reasonable manner? Even though we do not have enough samples to estimate P in a, uh, a reliable manner. Okay, so this is, uh, this is our theorem. Our theorem says that for any epsilon within the feasible range, which is from zero to one over one minus gamma, uh, the optimal policy generated by our perturbed model-based approach achieves the following thing. Uh, it's close to the uh, optimal value function in an entry-wise sense, uh, as long as the sample size exceeds uh, this guy, S times A over the horizons uh, to the third order and epsilon to the second order. Uh, there are some quick remarks here. Uh, the first remark is that this can be computed in a very efficient manner. Uh, basically, you run the so-called policy iteration for one over one minus gamma iterations and you get convergence. And uh, the other thing is that if you still remember, I said there is some converse bounds developed by Azar et al. a few years back. And if you compare these two bounds, they match except for some uh, uh, logarithmic factor. So coming back to the picture that I present to you now, this basically now says that, okay, so the converse bound is tight uh, and we are able to achieve it using some very, very simple plug-in approach, except that you need to randomly perturb the reward function a little bit. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me try to spend maybe two minutes talking about some of the analysis. Uh, and then before I'm moving on to, I move on to the second story. Uh, so some of the key ideas here, um, uh, first of all, it's a so-called leave one out analysis, uh, which originally come from, you know, some uh, maybe Charles Stein when he was analyzing the central limit theorem, but it has recently been widely used in analyzing a lot of statistical problems and optimization problems. Uh, we apply it to reinforcement learning as well uh, because it's a way for us to sort of like decouple statistical uh, dependency, complicated uh, statistical dependency, uh, uh, while at the same time allowing us to get fine-grained understanding about uh, the estimates. And the idea is very simple. Uh, so you have a uh, you you have a empirical you you have some samples for each of the state action pair. Now maybe let's try to say for each of the state action pair, let's just try to drop all of the samples in order to remove all the randomness. Which is a way for you to decouple the dependency uh, between the randomness associated with this state action pair. Uh, and which in turn allows you to do some fine grain control of some of the estimation error. Okay, I don't have time. And this actually has been applying many, many of uh, the works and including a lot of works that we have done in understanding non commerce optimization. Uh, I'm going to skip most of the details here. The only thing that I like to mention is that this idea works only if there is a separation condition. What is the separation condition? It's basically saying that if for each of the states, if you look at the Q function, optimal Q function generated by the optimal action, the resulting Q value needs to be strictly larger than the Q value uh, generated by other kind of action. So basically this means that I do not want to see any tie here. I want that there is only a single optimal action that's strictly better than the rest of them. Okay, now this becomes important because uh, now, okay, so we need some of this kind of separation and this actually is a fundamental reason that uh, we want to do perturbation because even though you can, you, you can easily find a lot of RL applications where 
you do see some tie. But after you randomly perturb the reward function, if you randomly perturb the reward function, let's say by adding some small Gaussian noise on top of the reward function, and with high probability, you are going to make sure that there's only a single policy that stands out, which is strictly better than the rest of them. And this is the only reason that we introduced this uh, reward perturbation, because we want to break the tie. Okay, and once you break the tie, and then the leave one out the coupling analysis becomes uh, effective, and then we can show uh, the, the effectiveness of this approach uh, all the way down to information theoretical limits. All right, okay, so uh, let me summarize, quickly summarize this part. Uh, I'll, basically, the, the key uh, message here is to say that a model-based uh, reinforcement learning uh, with a little bit of the perturbation turns out to be minimax optimal. Uh, it allows us to, to close the gap between the achievability bound and the converse bound, uh, and uh, so which allows us to improve the understanding sample efficiency uh, under this very simple uh, data sampling model. Any questions? Oh, hey, John. Yeah. Hey. Um, so if I think about leave one out analyses and separation, it just makes me think of like concentration of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Is this the same type of ideas or is it just it happens that these techniques are kind of just broadly applicable? It's broadly applicable for many of the, including the eigen, the, uh, eigen decomposition, it's broadly applicable when you want to get some like entry-wise control of some of the estimates. Uh, for example, for spectral method, you use this kind of approach, you are able to get L infinity known perturbation bound for the eigenvector or singular vectors. Um, yeah. Then for many other things, like Al Kalui has done this for the, the M estimation thing, they get you know, like a very fine grained understanding about it. Same for this uh, IO case, because we really want to get some uh, entry wise control about the problem. And for this kind of purpose, typical Levi out analysis gives us the tightest. Uh, possible statistical bound. Yeah. And there are a lot of connections. To okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yushen, can I ask okay. a question before you sure. move to the second sure, part sure. of the talk? Yeah. Sure. So can you go back to the simulation formulation slide that you started with? The simulator? Oh. The, the setup, right? The formulation which is based on this simulation that you're drawing samples. Yeah. So so here, it seems that the way you gather the data about P is completely exogenous to the control problem. Yeah. Because I could imagine where I, which state I visit and which action I take. In yeah. turn, it is dependent on how I'm you know, driving the car around, yeah. exploring the world. Yeah. So how can this be a reasonable problem? So, okay, so let me first say that this, uh, originally they started with this problem because in some of the applications, uh, they do have this kind of simulator in some, for example, like game playing kind of things. And sometimes even in autonomous driving, sometimes they have some physical simulator to simulate something about what's going on there. So uh, in some problem, they do have a simulator. Uh, but also, as you say, actually, there are many other sampling models that I actually didn't talk about in this talk uh, will include something that's far more complicated. For example, sometimes you are going to have some Markovian kind of data. Uh, basically, the kind of data you get after you start your uh, start from particular state, uh, the next data you are going to generate will generate in, be generated in a Markovian uh, fashion, which basically depends on what's happening in the past. Exactly. Uh, that's another thing that we have, uh, not in this work, but some other work. There are also some more, even more complicated things when uh, you have, you know, like uh, more adaptive kind of sampling. Uh, so basically, as they say, every every single time you can change your policy and you, you know, you, you based on, it's like the regret setting. You keep ch uh, changing your estimate of the policy and based on your current policy, you you, you take different uh, sample in a different way. So there are multiple different data collection mechanism there. 
this is uh, the simplest possible one. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that even for the simplest possible case, uh, the under there is still a gap uh, between uh, what is achievable and what is uh, not achievable. And for most of the other settings, including the one that you mentioned, they are also this kind of, uh, also exist the sample uh, size barrier there. For example, in this request setting, even though some people say, okay, model-based approach is also minimize optimal for those request setting, uh, usually you first need to make sure the sample size is very, very large, like S, S squared times A squared, something like that, in order to make these things to work. So also there's a lack of understanding when the sample size is really close to the most challenging region. So this is an example of the what's happening, uh, what, what, what is uh, unsatisfactory in the literature, but also then similar things also apply to, uh, uh, also arise in other sam sampling settings as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, all right. Okay. So let me move on to the second part because I think I don't have too much time. All right. Okay. So, uh, uh, okay. So this in the second part, I'm going to move to a completely different uh, IO algorithm. And this is based on two different uh, paper. One is uh, with Shi Chong Chen in Carnegie Mellon. Chen Chen is currently John student, and also my two colleagues uh, in uh, collaborators in CMU, and also another recent work uh, that we, we we just finished this year. Okay, so the second part is more about optimization. Okay, so and as you probably have heard. Uh, uh, policy optimization is the kind of approach that's really everywhere in the more modern IO algorithms, inclu including AlphaGo. Uh, so I'm not going to motivate things using AlphaGo, Go, but let me just try to say this uh, very limited. Uh, so, so the theoretical understanding about policy optimization turns out to be very, very limited. Uh, only until recently, uh, actually the last two to three years, uh, people started to pay a lot of attention to this and try to make progress. But still, uh, a lot of things remain unknown even for the simplest possible settings, uh, which really probably is also one of the reasons that this actually attracts a lot of attention now from uh, multiple different community, including machine learning optimization and uh, statistics as well. Okay, so let me try to briefly mention what is policy optimization. Okay, so as I mentioned, we want to maximize the value function. Okay, now let's try to formulate this and also as an optimization problem. Value function is a function for every single different state. So if you want to formulate this into an optimization problem, you'd better try to aggregate all the value function into a single number. And this is the reason that we have this row parameter here. Maybe just think about it as some uniform distribution. So you can try to maximize, for example, the average of the value function across all of the state. Okay. So this is just a simple way for you to aggregate the value function into a single number. Okay, so now this is an optimization problem we want to solve. We want to find the optimal policy. Now, Sometimes people feel that optimize directly over pi uh, might not be the only choice. Maybe you can try to find some smarter way to parameterize the problem in order to make it more amenable to optimization. Okay, uh, so instead of optimizing over pi, let's try to parameterize it using a parameter theta and then try to maximize over theta. So what is a common way to do this parameterization? Uh, this, this is a soft max uh, parameterization that's really everywhere. Uh, basically, it's just, you know, you have this theta, and you, you look at the exponential version of this and then properly normalize so that this allows you to represent all of the probability distributions, okay? So, I mean, it's, uh, and also it's sort of like, uh, differentiable, so it's uh, easier things for us to do optimization. Okay. After this, now you can go to you know whatever uh, converse, uh, optimization algorithm that you like to solve it. And one of the most famous paradigm policy gradient is basically just like this. Okay, let's run gradient descent after you do this 
proper parameterization and run gradient, actually gradient ascent in this case until it converges. Uh, and this actually is a famous algorithm proposed by uh, Rich Sutton uh, 20 years ago. Okay, so now, uh, however, even though this is a very popular algorithm, uh, the understanding, the theoretical understanding is extremely limited. Uh, actually, the first question that you might ask is that, is it even a good algorithm? Does it even converge to uh, a good policy? Because this is a highly non convex problem. So you might worry about non convexity So uh, two years ago, uh, about one and a half years ago by Agarwal et al., uh, they proved the following thing. So if you have a policy gradient, if you use softmax parameterization, it's guaranteed to converge to the global optimal as long as the number of iterations go to infinity. Okay, so this is a, a good result. It shows that it's, it is converging to the right point. But what is lacking is that uh, we do actually, this is a purely asymptotic result. Uh, it does not really tell you how fast this converges. And in fact, this does not preclude the possibility that this, it might take forever to converge. Okay, so motivated by this last year uh, by a group in the uh, uh, University of Alberta, uh, Chabar and Schumann and their group, they show that actually they try to make one step further. They show that uh, this algorithm actually takes one of epsilon iterations to converge, uh, which looks like a much better uh, performance guarantee compared to that. But what I would like to argue is that if you look at the theorem carefully, there is something missing here is that in, in front of it, there is some unspecified parameter that depends on almost everything, uh, the state space, action space, horizon, everything. And that remains unspecified. Actually, if you look at the paper, actually it's even more complicated. Actually, it depends even on the trajectory of the, the, this L. Okay, but let me just say this is unspecified. Okay, but without- a big... so, Sorry, this is a naive question. Yeah. But when you say uh, it converges to the global optimum, are there conditions on the parameterization for this to hold? I mean, does data have to take a particular form for this to actually uh, happen? We are talking about the softmax parameterization for this. No, no but, but, but presumably like, so theta is a featureization of your space, right? Yes. I mean, it, this can't hold for sort of an arbitrary mapping theta. It must have conditions on theta or just- No, it has no condition on theta, so. It, 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 I mean, there are the, there are generalization that put uh, constraint on theta, but in the, here we don't we don't put any. So, so oh, but I mean, you know, like theta can't be just some arbitrary measurable function of the states and actions. Oh, it's not a function; it's a number. So. Oh, 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 oh! So theta is just a big old matrix. Theta is a, just a big vector. So. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. That makes. So sense. there are there are more uh, complicated cases. We're assuming theta to be some function. That's like function approximation case. Uh, here we are considering even simpler case. Theta is just some. some oh, sorry. Now, now I understand. Sorry. So it's just theta of S A is a number. Yeah, it's a number. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I just mis misunderstood. All right. Okay. So now the question is that because this this per, uh, prefactor is unspecified, so. Uh, so I don't think this actually tells us a complete picture about what's going on. Uh, so our, our work is basically trying to make progress towards understanding this. Okay, so this is our uh, result. Actually, it turns out to be a negative result. Uh, our result said that uh, we can actually find a Markov decision process such that it takes the algorithm uh, almost like super exponential iterations to converge. Okay, so uh, it's S to the two to the one to the horizon. So if you are looking for uh, at problems with large state space and uh, also long horizon, actually it basically means that it takes like forever for you to converge. Okay, so uh, this is a super exponential lower bound, which somehow says that actually this uh, unspecified prefactor uh, uh, in, in Mace et al.'s work actually is really huge. Uh, it actually, without specifying that, actually uh, you might not really get to reasonable convergence guarantee for, for this algorithm. 
Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, uh, skip this part, but uh, let me try to see. Okay, so first I said that if you just run policy gradient with soft max parameterization, you, there are some hard instances that uh, for, for which the algorithm takes too long to converge. Now the question is that, can you actually modify your algorithm in order to improve the computational efficiency? So there are multiple different tricks that people have used in order to do so. Uh, one thing is to try to add regularization, okay. So in this case, uh, a popular approach is to add the so-called entropy regularization by adding this uh, quantity that I mark in blue. Okay, so why is it called the entropy regularization? Uh, it's basically because it turns out that it has a different form. Uh, it's like the original value function plus some weighted version of the Shannon entropy. Okay, so here, there are some parameters here. Uh, tau is a regularization parameter that is good to, for you to remember. D is just some marginal distribution. Uh, you don't really need to know what this is, but this is a common approach called entropy regularization used in practice. Okay, so now the, so an alternative then is just to try to solve this regularized version instead of the original problem, okay. And hopefully adding this uh, entropy regularization term might accelerate uh, optimization by a bit. Uh, unfortunately, uh, adding entropy regularization alone does not really uh, help us get rid of this exponential lower bound. Uh, it turns out that we can still get to an exponential lower bound saying that, you know, it takes the, this algorithm still exponential time to converge, even when you are adding entropy regularization. So this is, again, a negative message, and this is uh, not uh, something uh, that's appealing for us in practice. Uh, again, uh, this uh, algorithm has been analyzed in the prior work as well, but again, because of the lack of specification about this prefactor, uh, some of the message there could be quite misleading. Okay, so there is a second algorithmic trick that has also been widely used, uh, is rather than using policy gradient, let's try to change the gradient to the so-called uh, natural policy gradient. So the idea is very simple. Uh, maybe gradient distance is not working in the most, uh, in, the, in, the, in the best space. Maybe we can try to find a way to precondition the gradient in order to make it progress uh, faster. Okay, and it uh, actually, this dates back to Sham Kakadi's, uh, probably his PhD thesis. Uh, he come up with a way uh, that basically says that, okay, maybe you can try to precondition the gradient using the pseudo inverse of some feature information. Okay, uh, the good thing is that with these two tricks, entropy regularization and natural policy gradient, after both tricks are adopted, the algorithm works very well. The question now is uh, whether we can say something rigorously about the efficiency about this, uh, the, the, this, this version of uh, policy optimization. Okay, so let me just present to you the, the theorem. Tau, uh, uh, if you remember, this is a regularization parameter. Okay, let's just try to take tau to be something not too large. And then we can guarantee that the entropy regularized natural policy gradient method uh, achieves a converges very fast uh, to some epsilon accuracy. So here we do have some uh, linear convergence happening here. And in particular, there is a C1 parameter here that I didn't specify, but actually this is a quantity that scale only polynomially fast in all any of the problem parameter. So it's not going to affect our final iteration complexity by much. So let me just summarize uh, what we have, uh, what we can say using this uh, theorem. If you use the general learning rates, uh, the iteration complexity you have is roughly one over F, uh, eta times tau times some logarithmic factor. And you can, within the choice, feasible choice, you can take the optimal choice 
that gives you a much simpler bound so that the iteration complexity is roughly just one over one minus gum. So it's roughly the same as the iteration complexity for just policy iteration. Okay, and this is a nearly dimension-free kind of linear convergence. There is no other hidden uh, uh, prefactor that depends exponentially large in other problem parameters. So this is really some uh, a more non-asymptotic version of uh, iteration complexity that could be very uh, use, uh, uh, convincing in practice. Okay, finally, let me just try to show you some of the, uh, some of the numerics to show that regularization actually really helps. Uh, in the first pan, uh, in the left plot, I showed the performance of regularized natural policy gradient. In the right plot, I show the case when no entropy regularization is used. And as you can see that uh, the regularized version converges much faster than the second one, the unregularized one. And the performance guarantee that we get also significantly improves upon the unregularized natural policy gradient. Yushin, when you, when you say uh, the performance guarantee, you're getting convergence to Q tau, correct? No, the, the, we are talking about convergence to the true band. So, so we start so with the unregularized version uh, because I picked the tau to be small enough so that this additional penalty term doesn't, you know, change the value function by too much. Okay. So that's why I have a upper bound on tau here, basically to make sure the entropy term is doesn't penalty term does it, uh, is sufficiently small. So all right. Okay. Thank you. Got it. All right. Okay. So uh, okay. So this is a summary of the second part. Uh, it says that policy gradient, even though this is a very uh, widely used algorithm in practice, uh, the vanilla version actually might sometimes take exponential time or super exponential time to converge. Uh, but if you are able to change your algorithm by adding, for example, some regularization and pre do some preconditioning tricks, and it can uh, give you a uh, linear convergence uh, in a very uh, appealing way. All right, okay, so let me conclude my talk. Uh, basically, I'm trying to say that understanding the efficiency of reinforcement learning requires uh, a lot of tools from modern statistics and optimization. And I'm, I'm sure that there are a lot of uh, uh, opportunities in RL uh, that can be uh, uh, exploited by using these kinds of tools. Actually, the, the integrating thinking of statistical optimization is really helpful in order to understand the true efficiency of our IO algorithms in use. Okay, so these are the papers that are related to today's work. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>